Welcome to the Gamer's Tavern. This episode is all about the character types you love to hate. Those classes, races, builds, archetypes, clans, and so on that just start a hate fest every time they're even mentioned. But before we get into that, I just want to let you know that friend of the show, Ivan Van Norman's Kickstarter is up now. Uh, this is the one he talked about a couple of episodes ago. Uh, it's outbreak deep space uh it's zombies meets sci-fi and you can get your copy for just a 45 dollar pledge in print so you can find that by going to kickstarter and searching for outbreak deep space or you can check the show notes for a link and i also wanted to let everyone know that these past few weeks have been kind of difficult here at the gamers tavern uh my personal life's been a bit difficult recently and before that i had organizational issues due to trying to edit and produce and record both the gamers tavern and game table plus my day job plus the secret projects that i'm working on and uh, it's been a nightmare but the light at the end of the tunnel is here uh we have officially brought on nick jaworski to edit the gamers tavern permanently also, I'm moving. Unfortunately, it's in the same rural southeast Texas town and just like about five miles away, but it's a much bigger house for my family and it affords me the space to set up a full in-home recording studio for Gamers Tavern. Because of both of these, there's been a lot of movement on those secret projects I was talking about and announcements are coming very, very, very soon possibly as soon as next week's episode so make sure to stay tuned for that and i really want to thank all of our listeners for their patience during this time and i especially wanted to thank the fans that have put up with my you know vague explanations just flat out bitching on social media and there's just one more thing I wanted to bring up. In just a couple of weeks on Memorial Day weekend, both Ross and I will be at Comic Palooza in Houston, Texas. The convention runs May 23rd through the 26th, and there's still tickets available for one of the largest fan conventions in the state of Texas. Ross will be running games and hosting panels all over the place, and I'll be floating around covering the convention for any cool news. But we're both going to try to find time to record an episode or two of Gamers Tavern on site with some of the guests there and if possible we're going to try to find a way for our fans who are at the convention to watch us record live and participate uh we're not sure if we're gonna be able to work that out but you can follow me on twitter at abstruse you can follow the podcast on twitter at gamers tavern pc as in podcast and you can find out how to email us follow us on twitter like us on facebook all that stuff at our website at gamers tavern.org if you follow us we'll keep you up to date over exactly what we're doing and you'll know where to find us so, without any more interruptions, let's get started with episode 29 of the Gamer's Tavern. Grab a drink from the bar and take a seat at the table in the corner, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Hi, this is Nick Jaworski, and you may not realize it or probably don't care, but I edit some of the shows here on the Gamer's Tavern Podcast Network. If you like podcasts but love audio editing, then I have great news for you. I have my own show titled One Degree of Separation, and you can listen to it right now and subscribe at OneDegreeWithNick.com. The show is kind of hard to describe. Each episode is basically an experiment that contains original music, stories, interviews. It's probably just best if I quickly show you some recent episodes. Try to see what you had, if you had anything interesting for me. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever waterboarded somebody? It was actually a story of Abraham Lincoln, a very superstitious man, seeing his own doppelganger multiple times over a couple of nights. When looking in the mirror, he saw two faces, his normal face, and then a pale, ghostly one that, that worried him. I have to get back to editing right now, but you should go check out all of that and more at OneDegreeWithNick.com. Thanks. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Gamer's Tavern. I'm Ross Watson, your host. And I'm Daryl Mont Jr. And tonight we have with us a couple of great guests, uh, Mr. Justin Suzuki. Hello. And Mr. Brendan Gensimer. Hey there. Tonight we are going to be talking about some interesting character types, the types of characters that um, <laughs> kind of get a lot of hate out there. Uh, but before we dive right into that, 
let's talk about what our guests are like as far as their gaming character sheet. Um, I will start with uh, Brandon. What is your gaming character sheet like? Uh, my gaming character sheet is, as far as tabletop goes, rather sparse. Uh, I've only done work uh, with you, actually, on uh, Malifaux through the Breach, uh, working on In Defense of Innocence. Uh, outside of that, though, I've done uh, quite a bit of work in the video game industry, uh, working for uh, Tryon Worlds, Electronic Arts, Bioware, uh, doing work in the video game industry, and yeah. You might also recognize Brandon's dulcet tones from our <laughs> Gamers Tavern game table of Actual Player Shadowrun, where he is the GM. Yes, I am. I just got to the episode that the audience would have heard about two weeks ago, but it's the one where Molly's first introduced and you did that god-awful creepy laugh for the Halloweener that was so awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I still don't know where that came from. It just kind of happened. Channel your inner uh, Mark Hamill there. Yeah, that's. I'm guessing that's what it was. <laughs> You've also done some professional voice acting, is that right? Yes and no. Uh, I have done professional voice acting. I've been paid to... Uh, you know, give my voice to different companies. However, none of them have actually published anything that I've recorded. So <laughs> it still counts. It, it still counts because I got paid. But no, I... <laughs> <laughs> say, nothing, check clears, that's good enough. Yeah. Nothing you've ever heard of, but yes, yeah, nothing you've <laughs> never ever heard of. But I, I did get paid for it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Mr. Suzuki, why don't you tell us about who you are, where we know you from, in terms of your gaming character sheet? Uh, let's see. Well, uh, you might have heard it might. Gaming character sheet has to start with my podcast. Uh, I'm a co-host on Roleplay DNA and Smiling Jack's Bar and Grill. Uh, Smiling Jack's Bar and Grill is primarily a Savage Worlds podcast. Uh, as far as professional work, I actually have a very limited experience, but I have worked for uh, Reality Blurs, Sean Preston. Uh, I helped play test Tremulous and uh, helped out with the Kickstarter campaign on that, which I was very happy to see be successful. I had the very smallest part in that, but I, I'm still proud of the work. Other than that, I've worked in the, my local gaming community here in Colorado to help. Uh, I've helped out some local conventions. I run my own charity game day and uh, charity game organization called Gamers Giving. And other than that, uh, my video game work uh, is primarily on the consumer side. So I'm really good at you know, controllers. So on your character sheet, are you an elf? <laughs> Am I an elf? <laughs> no. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm, a, I'm, a very, I'm the tallest dwarf in town. <laughs> uh, let me say, as a as a guest of honor who's been to Genghis Khan multiple times, uh, Justin and his hard work at Genghis Khan is always appreciated, uh, particularly his work with the Rocky Mountain Savages. Yes, I do work a little bit with the Rocky Mountain Savages, um, but my other co-host on Smiley Jack's Bar and Grill, Chris Fox, he does the lion's share of the work for that. Fox. Fox. That's how you pronounce that name. Yes. F-U-C-H-S. Oh my God! It's Fox. <laughs> <laughs> I've been getting it wrong for a long time. And Chris is such a nice guy that he would he will never correct you unless you dry, directly <laughs> ask him. Which I had to one day. I was like, "Is it pronounced this or that?" And he said, "No." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, I've been calling you a wow. horrible name this whole time." Me too. <laughs> Me too. Oh no. Please extend my apologies to oh, Chris. Next oh, time Chris, talk to him. Chris doesn't. I mean, the fact that you even know who Chris is and are worried about his last name, I'm sure will be bring him great joy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this is actually the first time we've had another podcaster on with us on the Gamers Tavern. So welcome. And uh, please don't talk bad about us behind our back. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll talk bad to you right onto your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, now that we've got everybody's character sheet, um, let's talk about uh, what we've been playing lately. Uh, Daryl, why don't we start with you? Um, I have been doing a lot of prep work for a D&D Next game. Uh, right now I'm not doing a lot of the nuts and bolts of it because, well, it's going to be coming out in its final edition soon, so it's not really much point in that. But uh, it's something I'm trying to put together for work in the future, and i uh, Spoiler alert, I actually am not playing in the game table game anymore. Uh, it's, Brandon's an awesome GM on the game. It's just my play style and his GM style were clashing too much, and I figured it would be better if I withdrew. Sometimes that's just kind of how it is. I mean, you have people that have one style of play and just trying to mesh with another style of play. Sometimes it's just like oil and water. It happens and no hard feelings on either side. I would at least no hard feelings on my side, at least. So. Mine either, no. 
Yeah, it's happened to me before um, as well. Uh, so, yeah, you know, kudos for working it out like big boys. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else sterile you've been playing lately? Any computer games or consoles? or? Uh, it's, I'm still hooked on 2040 hate. <laughs> It'll work. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have played that little in browser game where you're like matching no. the twos to the fours. It's one of those really, really, it's like Flappy Birds and Candy Crush and all those games, but it's all about powers of two. So it appeals to my like math nerdy side a little bit more because wow. you're, you're mat, you take two twos and you make a four. You make two fours and you make an eight. You make two eights, you make a 16 and so on. And the goal is to get to 2048. And the best I've gotten so far is, uh, I think I got 1,024 once and that was it. But it's one of those games where it's like you're sitting there playing and it's like, okay, I'll play this for a few minutes while I'm waiting for my next break. And then you look at the clock and it's an hour later wow. because it just sucks you in. But yeah, you know, I'll, when it comes to my turn, I will definitely talk about addictive games. <laughs> uh, why don't we, uh, hit Justin again? What have you been playing lately? Uh, I'm actually not at my regular Tuesday night game tonight because I'm just getting over a pretty nasty bug. Um, so if my voice sounds strange to any of my regular listeners, all five of you, that's why. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I usually play uh, Savage Worlds Deadlands every Tuesday night where I run nice. a, a kind of enclosed little episodic game for working professionals who can only drop in once in a while. But we play a Deadlands version of Boulder, Colorado. And if you know anything about Boulder, Colorado, it's weird. So in Deadlands, it's even weirder. And then uh, I just started a, another regular game for a group of people who requested I run Interface Zero 2.0 for them. Yes, nice. I I would like to play that as well sometime. Yeah, it's, so first game went really well. It took a lot of – they didn't actually understand cyberpunk all that well. They didn't understand the genre. So Really? Oh, yeah. It took, a, it, it took a little instruction on how to – and what the world was like. You, you know what's interesting about that? We actually recorded an entire show about cyberpunk gaming. And what it is and how to define it and all that other stuff. Now that yep. I remember that, now I wish you would have told me that. I would have said, here you go. Listen to this. Because <laughs> now I remember that episode because I'm a cyberpunk <laughs> junkie. Love cyberpunk. And then other than that, I'm just uh, writing some games for some upcoming conventions. I just got a crazy idea in my head that I'm trying to work out. And uh, so far, so good. And that's the only other thing I'm really working on. I'm also trying to professionally write a couple modules to submit. One for Dungeon Crawl Classics Sweet. and one for... Uh, Realms of Cthulhu. Oh, sweet, man. Good luck. For for Deadlands, uh, when we played it back in the day, and this was like over 10 years ago, so it's, it is way back in the day. But what we did to make it feel just like even more Deadlands-y is we, t we uh, took a cowboy hat and turned it upside down in the middle of the table, and that's what we threw our bennies into when they were spent. That's not a bad idea. I love that idea. I'll just have to find a cowboy hat. I own a pink hat. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work, though. <laughs> Yeah, you can't be like the silver lame. It has oh, to be. Oh, it's, it's a big, you know, like furry a, purple hat with a <laughs> big feather coming off the side of it. I don't, I don't know. That's a pimp hat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well Ross and I both live in Texas, so we're we, we wear cowboy hats all the time around these parts, partner. Of course you do. <laughs> well, I live in Colorado, and some people think that of me that I wear, I ski, and I wear a cowboy hat and chap. <laughs> you don't ski in chaps. Oh, uh, no, because I found that um, – never mind. I'm not going to go into the story. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but let me just uh, say, ouch, ouch. Ooh. <laughs> All right, Brendan, uh, what have you been playing lately? Lately, I've been GMing a uh, Shadowrun 4th edition game that you may or may not have heard of. It's the uh, uh, actual play here on Gamers Tavern. I'm also part of a D&D uh, 3.5 slash Pathfinder game that's getting rolling. And it's kind of a uh, reintroduction to the roll to or to the uh, d20 system, and it's been uh, kind of like a splash in the face with cold water, just getting back to where it all started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brandon, we had a really good uh, conversation on this just a while ago about character optimization, particularly with uh, 3.5 Pathfinder. And let me tell you, Brandon really opened my eyes about some of the possibilities. Like, I, you know, there were basically character types I almost just dismissed. And Brandon's like, no, 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 no. There's things you can do to make them awesome. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. that. That is one of the few true beauties of the D20 system as it exists in uh, Pathfinder and 3.5 is that you can, you can get into the absolute minutia of how you put your character together to create something that, in theory, doesn't work, but in mechanics it does. It's a very deep mechanical... Uh, well to build your character from. Lots of different options. Oh, yeah. 
And uh, that's about it as far as uh, tabletop gaming goes. For video games, I've been playing the Shadowrun Return series. I've also been playing Kerbal Space Program a fair bit. And uh, League of Legends. And that's pretty much the games that I've been playing as of recent, you know, the past two, three days. You have a Twitch for actually running uh, Shadowrun Returns where you talk about the... Well, what do you talk about? On Impulse 101, which is my Twitch channel, it's spelled with a Y and seven I. What I basically do is I discuss how games are put together, the mechanics involved, uh, design decisions, and the psychology of actually playing the game and how it affects the decisions made at the design level. Uh, for instance, if you make a decision at the design level to do this, how is a player going to react? And that's the kind of things that I talk about and get into on my uh, Twitch channel. Very cool. Well, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. What have I been playing lately, Ross? <laughs> yes, Ross, please do tell. <laughs> hey, Ross, what have you been playing lately? <laughs> uh, well, I have the actual play Shadowrun, Run, uh, where I play uh, Rafe, uh, Ravenblood, Black Wolf, Deathblade, and that's been going great. Um, I've been playing in the uh, the other game I have, which is the Avengers Next Generation, where I play Valkyrie 2. Uh, you know, I came into that game thinking I was going to be playing Thor. It turns out I'm actually playing Captain America because everyone else on that team is much stronger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm okay with that because Captain America is still pretty awesome if you play him the right way. Um, unfortunately for me, the last game I played, uh, it was really fun, but it was one of those role-playing games where just everything, you know, you start to tally up all the things you did that did, that failed. And I, I had a list of like four things at the end of the night. I was like, I tried this and it, it didn't work. I tried this other thing. And it didn't work. <laughs> so a bit of a frustrating night for me uh, in terms of like what my character could do, but uh, I'm still enjoying it. We actually just ras- wrapped up our uh, law- on- ongoing Accursed RPG that I've been running here in Texas. Uh, we had a great uh, final encounter with uh, one of the witches, and uh, all my players really enjoyed it. It was great to... Uh, to kind of, you know, tell a, a story with some closure at the end of it. Um, you know, Brandon has been in my, uh, my short campaigns, I guess is what I would call them, because they don't run more than like 15, 20 sessions. But uh, they, I, I like to think that they do have a nice little arc that wraps up at the end. So, oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> we, had, we had a good time with that. And lastly, I did say I was going to address addictive games. Not to uh, cut you off, but I have to ask, which which was it? Uh, they took on and seemingly destroyed uh, the Morrigan. Really? Yes. <laughs> yes. They uh, they brokered a deal with the Unseely Fae to travel there via the the fairy uh, rings and brought with them a large amount of cold iron, which they shot right into her black little heart. <laughs> as, as you normally would. As you do. <laughs> the, the funny part was they did this as part of a deal with the Unseely where the Unseely were like, listen, all we want is for you to, to give us back the thing she stole, which is the Dark Cauldron. We want you to give us back the Dark Cauldron. And if you don't do this, because this party has a really bad habit of like making deals and then not sticking to them. <laughs> um, the fair, the Unseely were like, listen, if you don't do this, we will then put all of our efforts behind the witches in other lands for a year and a day. <laughs> and we will help them as much as we can. <laughs> so don't screw this up. Well, during the fight with the Morgan, they destroyed the Dark Cauldron. I mean, just blew it up with a missile, destroyed the, the Dark Cauldron. So, yeah, the the aftermath of the, uh, yay, we destroyed one of the witches. Boo, the Unseelie are helping all the others for your day. Great. <laughs> uh, so I, I did say I was going to address addictive games, uh, and I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Um, Blood Bowl on, on Steam is just incredibly addictive. <laughs> I am struggling so hard to not play that. Right now, uh, I just picked up Age of Wonders 3. I'm looking forward to trying that out. And I still have Assassin's Creed 4 waiting for me, sort of calling my name. Um, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to get into that. Um, but at the same time, there's Dawn of War 2 Retribution that I've also been putting off for a long time. I don't know. Anyway, a bunch of computer games that are sort of begging me for more time. I just I did I realized I didn't talk about my video games really quick and you want to talk about addictive. I've been playing Titanfall till my eyes bleed. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to bring that up. Sorry. That's like the Halo meets BattleTech game, isn't it? Yeah, it's a first person shooter where or less, yeah. you know, 3 minutes into your combat you can call a giant mech down and start <laughs> Which is, they've, of course, made a great webcomic about that where the guys on the dropship like, why can't I just stay up here for three more minutes? And until it's done being built, yeah. Yeah, I'll just wait here. There's a certain <laughs> logic that breaks when you're like, I could have just 
<laughs> well, you could just let them run around for three minutes, not shoot any of us, and then we could just jump down and they snap. <laughs> <laughs> why, why doesn't everybody do that? Yeah, but then, you know, the game's just all about Titans, and, you know, then who wants to just... Everybody. That's Sorry. true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I remember another webcomic when they were talking about describing the game at E3, and there's a guy standing there and says, so what do you think of Titanfall? Oh, I love the part where I'm running around the giant robot. And the guy's like, well, what about when you were not in the giant robot? And the guy's like, I don't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> you mean there's, well, he's, why would anybody want to do that? You know? <laughs> I, I call that the waiting time for the game to begin, you know, just yeah, like, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. I'll just run yeah, around until my Titan comes. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go on to the next stage of the podcast, the Tavern Tales. Brandon. Yes, sir. Can you give us a story about a memorable die roll? A memorable die roll. There, there have been quite a few. Let's see. A very memorable die roll, and this is utilizing the Shadowrun's 4th edition edge system, but the uh, group was trying to get out of a corporate office of some sort, if memory serves, and they were extracting through a parking garage. And one of the characters, which was a Razor Girl, decided that she was going to skate on rollerblades down through the parking garage and destroy an armored vehicle that had been parked there as part of a high-threat response team. Oh, God. <laughs> and this Razor Girl only had, you know, claws. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to burn an edge to make these physics work. And then he rolled exquisitely. He got something crazy like 27, 28 hits <laughs> on 13 <laughs> dice. <laughs> and he Michael Bayed the shit out of, <laughs> and he Michael Bayed the shit out of that armored vehicle. He like did the splits, went under it, cut all the gas lines, made a spark, and it exploded gloriously, killing everybody. And the group got away without a problem. Wasn't that Lewis? It was Lewis, yes. <laughs> Oh my god, that was a guy in our local group uh, who was <laughs> famous for his crazy, crazy antics. Yes, you, if you needed someone to think outside of the box, you would just look at him and say, how should we solve this? And <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And he would come up with the most insane way of accomplishing yes. the task. <laughs> it's true. So, uh, Justin, what's a memorable die roll that you can think of? Oh, because I believe memorable die rolls are the ones that tend to bring up funny scenes. I mean, I, I like the cool ones, but I was playing cyberpunk to bring up cyberpunk again. I was playing cyberpunk oh. run by uh, Harley Stroh, GM extraordinary. Which edition? Uh, this is the 2020, not the, okay. not the newest. Yeah. The, yeah. 2020 edition. And not um, the one with the GI Joe dolls. No, 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 no. Okay. Basically the scene set up that we were just this huge gunfight between us street samurai. And I think it was Militech or one of the major corporations. And we're on this dock. And at one point I said, I'm going to hop in a hover van. I'm going to take off and I was going to do something cool. I failed the roll and the hover van went into the ocean and started to sink. And Harley being Harley said, well, your next turn roll again to see if you can get out of there. I failed that one. Roll one more time. I fumbled it. And he goes, well, you're, oh. <laughs> you're, he goes, you're sinking. I said, I'm sorry. But then someone else got to a crane with one of those little uh, magnetic you know, little uh, <laughs> things on the end of it. And he says, I want to swing it around and try to get the hover van out of the ocean. He says, if you, if you crit this roll, that happens. The guy critted it. My van comes lifting <laughs> out. And I said, my character's like, yes, I've done it. I'm driving the van out of the water. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, it, it, you know, the other guy's like, you know, I did that. I was like, no, 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 no. That was all me. So it was, that, that, those are the kind of roles I always, I, I love. I got to admit, uh, my, my mental image of you fumbling the roll to get out of the van is like you're reaching for the manual crank for the window and it pops off in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you're like, you have that, that scene where you hold it up in front of you with the unbelieving eyes. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> shit. I think the first time was me going looking for the button and going, oh, no, it's not a button. And then it's going for the crank. <laughs> And then realizing, oh, pops right off. Yeah. And then also the van lifts out of the water and going, oh, the van is working. You're like, oh, yay. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's jump into our main topic tonight. Here's a question for our guests um, or, you know, Daryl, too, if you want to jump in. What would you consider to be, for tabletop gaming, some of the most hated character types? Not player types. Character types. Character type. yeah. types. No, I'm talking character type. Okay. <laughs> I, I, All right. Yeah, and I consider him one guy that goes from <laughs> table to table and infects a player's mind thinking this is a good idea. All right. All right. The Who angry is it? loner. Ooh. I blame Batman for this a lot. 
um, the guy who's like, I'm the brooding loner in the corner. I, you know, I'm against, I, I work for no man. I I'm by myself and these kind of things. And is, he's usually the guy that can be an anchor to the rest of the table, not the story, not to himself, but like to the collective grouping. Cause you will have, and I just experienced this. You have one group who says, we've been hired to go do this thing. And we walk out the door and 30 minutes of role playing goes by. I'm not exaggerating. This just happened. And they say, Hey, angry loner guy, can you help out with this? And he says, I'm still back at the bar. (laughs) What do you mean? You never asked me to work for you. I don't work for you guys. I work on my own. And so the angry loner. Yeah. The lone wolf rides alone. The lone wolf who's in a group of eight. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that can be, um, that can be a real bummer. I got you. And it's not the player. (laughs) It's a guy going, oh, I'd love – and it's a cool concept. It really is. Well, I mean you have to put some of the blame on the player for there, certainly. You <laughs> well, know. yeah, but that's true of any character type unless I'm well, misinterpreting your question. We can redefine the question in just a second. But I, I think you know, specifically in the, in the idea – like I think there's ways to play a lone wolf character that aren't being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but what you described, I think, is a failure of both. I think that's probably just a, not not just a bad player, but the idea of a concept that a character concept that just doesn't work with a team based activity. And I always see that guy. Well, I did always see that guy when I was playing Shadowrun in my teenage years. It was always the guy who had the titanium bone lacing, the cyber spurs, and the enhanced Wolverine. sense of smell. Exactly. Wolverine. <laughs> yep. It's always Wolverine. <laughs> I always saw Batman. Yeah. I always been like, oh, my parents died when I was very young. It's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Congratulations on hard luck story number three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if if you if you literally had your parents die when you were that young and had all that money and then a butler who basically had to do whatever you said, your childhood would be kind of awesome. You might be like, you might grow up to be like, I don't know, candy man or toy man, or you'd be like, this is awesome. <laughs> Fraternity man. <laughs> Fraternity yeah, bro man. Bro man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bro man, it's bro dude. Bro dude. Yeah. Douche guy. Dude bro. Dude bro. <laughs> so sorry if I misinterpreted your question initially. No, that's that's fair. I think uh I think what we were kind of aiming for is maybe some more ideas like Kender, Octavians. Oh. Bards, gnomes. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Brandon, what do you think? My I guess example would be the uh chaotic stupid character type, which <laughs> Kender and Gnomes and Malkavians especially definitely fall into, which is the character, because for whatever reason, has the excuse to be able to do whatever they want on a whim. And so they just do whatever they want on a whim. And it usually is extremely disruptive to the game on the whole. At its simplest, that would be my statement of the most hated character type, which is chaotic, stupid of any flavor. And I'll, I'll change my answer. Paladins. Unless, really? it's a, unless it's a party of paladins, I, I find paladins to be yeah. extremely yeah. disruptive to a game. No yep. kidding. Oh, oh yeah. Paladins paladins are the other, they are the other side of that spectrum. Absolutely. Got the chaotic stupid and the lawful stupid. I was actually going to go kind of similar to Justin's answer. I was going to say, uh, for me, uh, it always comes back to Jedi. Like in a Star Wars game, it can severely derail a Star Wars game to have, <laughs> you know, it's, that, it's the old, uh, you know, it's what I, I, I want to actually like name this as like the Spoonie Parable. Uh, cause it's based on something he said, but the all Jedi or no Jedi party. Yep. <laughs> the, the Spoonie parable because of the f- possibilities of being so disruptive. But, you know, it, it, that doesn't, that's not true for every game and every group. It's, and, and let's be clear, we're not talking about things that are true for every game or every group. We're talking about specific things that we have had in our own personal histories as gamers. And there's some character types that just you mention on a forum or on Twitter or something like that. That <laughs> oh hey, I've got this new character. I'm playing a bard, and all of a sudden the deluge of trolls. Bard stuff, you suck. Bards are terrible. Just comes down, and you get the same thing with gnomes, kinders, illusionists. Uh, I've seen a lot on Shadowrun and uh, Cyberpunk with deckers, hackers, and net runners. Kinders for sure. Uh, kinders yes. have been true since the '90s. 
uh, actually, maybe even the late 80s, Kenders have been true. Um, of course, I remember when Dragonlance just came out, and, like, I wanted to play a Kender. And this being the early, well, mid-80s, uh, you know, we were like, okay, sure, you're a Kender. And then nobody really realized what it was like when you were a kleptomaniac, fearless little <laughs> kid, basically, with an oversized slingshot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of sucked all the epic right out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You've, I mean, you know, I had a GM, no shit, like, spend five minutes describing this awesome encounter with the Death Knight, and then I'm like, I stole a sword. <laughs> <laughs> Felt, it, it fell into my pocket. Yeah, Kinder got, you put a, Kinder are a really great idea for, like, a fiction book. They work great in a fiction book. Uh, not, I don't think it's a good idea at the table, though, typically. Typically. I think all these concepts, like, Jedi is a great example of something that, in a story, in a fictional story, works awesome as, as long as it's not a prequel <laughs> but it goes back to your all paladins or no all jedi or no jedi right i mean in in the prequels jedi are everywhere in the the only real trilogy out there jedi are very few there's one you, you mean the holy trinity the holy tri- trilogy so is is it a failure or am i jumping ahead here of my question is it a failure on the on the character types or is it a failure on the players because it's sort of like the angry loner batman as a storyline is awesome and in Justice, well, think, in Justice League, he's a quote-unquote team player. But if you put that guy yeah. at the table and say, you're going to run Batman, he's going to go, okay, I'm on my own. Well, you know, again, I think it's important to note that we're not talking about all Malkavians or all Kender or even Kender in general. We're talking about the perception of them and, again, you know, our – you know, things that are based on our personal – histories with them. But it's worth talking about them in the general sense just to kind of find out why people – or why they have this uh, perception amongst the larger audience or the larger gaming space of gamers. I think, is, is that fair to say? Yeah. The thing I find fascinating about it is just how universal it is. It's like you go to any forum anywhere and it's always the same ones that seem to pop up. And it's the ones we've mentioned so far always well, show up as what do you hate most about this? And someone's going to name in that thread, every single thing we've mentioned so far. Well, the one about the Mal- Malkavian, um, I've heard as a very specific kind. Fish milk. Fish milk, yeah. Which is the, I'm insane because fuck you, I'm insane, right? He just doesn't, there's a, there's no rhyme or reason to that character. So named fish yep. milk because they'll just run up and slap the prince with the fish. Well, I believe it actually goes back to an illustration in the, uh, either in the core book of Vampire or the Malkavian clan book of a dude walking around with a fish. Hmm. I believe it's basically a, a placeholder for this doesn't make any goddamn sense. Kind of like the bunny with the pancake on his head. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you know Bill Keys. <laughs> it makes perfect sense to me. I've seen him with a pancake on his head. Yeah. But Justin has a really great point. Why don't we, since we've talked about like what, we've at least identified some of them, right? Let's say, um, let's talk about what is it about these character types that causes so much, well, hatred. I mean, uh, it causes such strong emotions. Let's put it that way. I, I think that these character types, and, we, and let's face it, I mean, you know, you can call these stereotypes of classes or races within a, any game system, but I think they're there because they're true on some level. And I think what happens is that if we can continue with the Jedi or Paladin example is that those are characters that are meant to be central to the story. They're meant to be spotlights on them 80% of the time. Like something, the, the story is definitely revolving around them. As, and, and if you throw that into a shared experience or a shared storytelling group, how do I ignore the Jedi being such a large part of my Star Wars game? Actually, I don't think that's the problem so much, Justin. Or at least it hasn't been in my experience. Uh, in my experience, the problem with those two classes and... Again, I have played both of them, and they're, they can be really fun, and I've seen people play them excellently. But the problem I have seen crop up with those two classes is due to their uh, behavior, behavioral codes. They will not do certain things, and they will not allow others to do certain things. The lack of ability to compromise with the group on a yes. course of action. Yeah, that's, that's where I think they run into that. I, I think a good way to explain it is that the class's mechanics, the central core mechanics, such as the behavioral code, incentivizes disruptive play. Yes, that's a very good way of putting it. I I, wow. I, I can agree with that. I and but I still maintain that I think that it brings about a certain kind of, you know, if you go to Kendra or something like that, that that's the kind of character that would be, kind of tearing up the scenery in a in a scene. He'd be the guy 
maybe comic relief, maybe just sort of change the tone of the story. But if, as soon as he engages into the story, like you said, Oh, I stole that bad guy's sword. And it's like, Oh, in a movie, would that be like, ha 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 ha, you know, but in a, in a story like, you know, in a, a table like that, I, I don't think that works as well. So I, I, I agree that, yeah, okay. What you guys are saying is true, but I think there's a certain truth to yes. Mechanically a paladin gets rewarded for acting like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, that, I mean, that's that's interpretive, right? I mean, it, there's there's ways to interpret that where that is true, which, which means you're kind of a jerk yourself, in my opinion. But right. <laughs> <laughs> there's ways to interpret it where it's not that. No, I absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, here's the thing I'm going to throw out there, specifically with guys like Kender and Malkavian. Okay, it's not just that they're disruptive. I mean, although that is that is a big deal because they are disruptive. But what I think is the problem is I think they actually actively change the tone of the game yes right i think i think it's an, it kind of literally pulls you out of the immersive space that the gm has pulled, put you into because of their Be- because they so readily break the fourth wall yeah i guess yeah <laughs> yeah <clears throat> the way i would describe it or at least my interpretation of what you're trying to say ross is that they their antics actively break the fourth wall if you've ever read a Deadpool comic, you know exactly what breaking the, <laughs> the uh, yep. fourth and he wall can be is. A great, he can still be a great character, but yeah, it's it's you know there's a certain tone when Deadpool is in the comic. Yes, and when he shows up in say like an ensemble thing like I don't know, Marvel Ultimate Alliance two, right? He changes the tone of the game in the scenes that he's in. Yes, Daryl. Actually, I'm going to ask you about this one. So you mentioned Barb's. Mm-hmm. And like illusionists and of things of that nature. Why do you think those, I mean, cause I love bards, frankly, but why do you think those classes cause such a, a, a distinct reaction? In my opinion, those two specifically, it's because Dungeons and Dragons and by extension Pathfinder and the OSR games and everything else are more or less very combat oriented. It's about defeat the monster and take their treasure or defeat the monster and save the world. It's, that's kind of what the games are about. It's a lot more confrontational. So, sure, in a game like Shadowrun, you kind of want the face in the party that's going to sit there and smooth talk your way right into the building. The Bard and the Illusionist both are tricksters. They're meant to smooth talk your way around what a lot of people, especially the vocal people online, consider the fun part of D&D, which is the fight. Why would you want an Illusionist who's going to trick the orc they're guarding the gate to go away when you can run up and start stabbing them. So you're saying the paradigm of Dungeons and Dragons is, is, is primarily, you know, dungeon, you know, kind of encounters that are combat heavy. And if it, and if you're doing that style of game, which is kind of, I guess the, the typical defaults probably, uh, you know, having characters that are really good at social encounters are probably not going to be optimal for the rest of the party. They're going to feel like they have to carry these guys. Exactly. And that's the way it has been in a lot of the editions, especially with bards is in first edition, bards were awesome, but it was mostly because you had to go through like, what was it? Nine levels of rogue and then six levels of illusionist. Then you could start on a uh, bard. I think it was something like that. You know, we can look that up on the internet. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if only there were some but kind of database, then it, but then it kept slowly eroding their kind of power base where it ended up up all the way up into 3.5 in Pathfinder. They were more along the lines of the jack of all trades, master of none. So when you, it didn't really matter unless you were playing a very socially optimized, a very social, very political style game. The bard was the guy who was second best out of everyone at the party. And so, like you said, it felt like the party was kind of carrying this one guy. He wasn't picking the locks as good as the rogue. He wasn't, fighting as well as the fighter. He wasn't casting spells as well as the wizard. Yeah. And that's true. Uh, it, it is true that bars are typically not as uh, powerful in any particular niche because of their, their design. Uh, but, you know, I will, I will say that I think there are great bards out there as characters. And I think they can be, again, you know, it depends on the type of game you're playing. And, um, and of course, how, who, who could forget Aelin of the order of the stick? Mm-hmm. One of the best characters in the in the entire show, who is a bard. Uh, uh, again, speaking of fourth wall breaking. Well, yeah, but he's awesome. But it also anyway, fits the tone of that. Just show. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you got a point though that if you're playing, you know, on the dungeon paradigm, bards are probably you know very suboptimal for your uh, for your kick in the door, kill the orc in the ten by ten room because there's pie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's throw another one out there. Um, and this is a good one for actually both of our guests and Daryl. So it's good for it's a free for all. All right. <laughs> um, Deckers, hackers, and netrunners. I, I personally feel that the main source of discontent and dislike for them is the fact that the mechanics involved for them separates them from the rest of the group. Uh, it it, for, it forces them into an isolated sort of thing, which, at least for Shadowrun, I haven't played much Netrunner, but at least for Shadowrun, that is a rather large time investment for one person for what is essentially going to be a small aspect of the game as a whole. And that's where their uh, people begin to dislike them because of that. On top of that, the rules for it are esoteric, arcane, and just sometimes straight up backwards. And that's another reason why they're disliked so vehemently. I personally, in running all the Shadowrun games that I've ran, I've only experienced one or two good, quote, hackers, deckers, where it didn't disrupt the flow of the game, and it was actually enjoyable for everyone involved. Out of maybe seven or eight. So, you know, you're looking like a 20% success rate on a class that is ostensibly vital to the setting as a whole. If I remember correctly, you used some house rules on those anyway. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Because <laughs> because of the, the aforementioned esoteric and arcane mechanics of it. <laughs> Yeah, there's, a, there's actually some debate over the actual core hacking rules for fourth edition Shadowrun, which was out for a very long time. But there's still questions about the core mechanics over what exactly do you use to determine what you roll your dice? Is it skill and attribute and, or is it, are your programs involved? Is it skill yeah. plus programs, attribute plus programs? And, and so, let's not get into Cyberpunk 2020, which you might as well, <laughs> you might as well just ran a separate game. If someone, I used to tell players like, I want to run a net runner. I'd be like, okay, so you will not be playing with the group itself. We will set up another time for you to play your game because it's going to take too long for us to resolve everything you want to do. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you know, interface zero, the first uh, edition actually still had that problem a little bit. And then with interface 2.0, I'm happy to report that, uh, David Jarvis has really boiled it down to the bare essentials for what it should be, which is, hey, I'm I'm in the thick of it myself. We need to get that door across the way open. I'm here to do that. Hey, Justin, why don't, why don't you ask that guy if you wouldn't mind coming on our show sometime to talk to us about it? Because we are all big cyberpunk fans. <laughs> and... Absolutely. I'm sure he'd love to. Cool. Yeah, because I'm very curious to find out more about Interface Zero. Honestly. And that's the other thing on my character sheet. I'm agent to the RPG industry folk out there. So if you need Interface someone to represent <laughs> you, to get you into conventions, on podcasts, you let me know. You're, you're, you're what's called a fixer, Justin. Yes. But I, actually, I will say I have seen a Netrunner uh, run very well by a friend of mine named uh, Matthew, who he played the guy in the van. He did not enter combat. He's like, I have my comms up. I'm, I've got... I'm hacked into the video feeds. And I mean, the system was very boiled down to so that way. Hacking rolls went a lot quicker, but he played it very much like I do. I do not want to be in the middle of combat because I will die. So I'll be the guy, you know, finding information for you guys, getting, getting you what you need, opening doors, doing that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think, I think in that case, you can argue though, that he's by trying to streamline the, the, the function that the, the niche where he's supposed to fit, he's actively removing himself from, any possibility of engaging some of the other types like social, uh, you know, actual combat. He's, he's kind of removing himself from the, the other systems in play. Yeah. But I think to be an effective person in that kind of character type, you have to, I disagree. I don't, I don't think you have to, I think, I think that's a choice. I think it's a, it's not an unreasonable choice, but it is you deciding that's what's the way you want to go. Ross, you ignorant slut. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think, yeah, you could probably like with a bard or like any of these other character classes we're talking about, if we stick with net runners here or hackers or, or what have you, I think, yeah, you can think outside the box a little bit and go, okay, well, I'll still be at the front of the party interface zero 2.0. You, they can do that. The hacker can absolutely be there the whole time. Um, and, and be an effective player, uh, right there and, and still be involved in the entire game. But I think that, you know, it, it sort of fits in a little bit better if you sort of say, well, I'm, I'm just going to be behind the, the, you know, you know, back in the rear with the gear kind of situation. I'm, I'm well, gonna it keep makes the, it easier for him. He only has to get involved when he has needs and, to. And, and, you know, and if a GM wants to mess with that, he absolutely can by going, oh, guess what? They traced where you're coming from and they're sending a tactical team to your van. What are you going to do now? <laughs> 
you know, I, I hate to push back on this because I feel like this is kind of that whole like game designers make the worst gamers paradigm. <laughs> uh, but but to me, that actually feels like you're you're in order to set up that kind of dilemma, you would need to deprotagonize him a little bit. You're you're saying you're not a good enough hacker, therefore I tracked you. I mean, it I, it, it feels a little awkward to me. That's all. No, I'm I would absolutely make the roles like opposed roles. Like if right. I'm if I'm infiltrating a system or if I'm going get breaking into a system. And he did the role comes up that you were detected. Well, they're going to start trying to trace you. And most of these systems set up a way. It's like, okay, I'm hiding my, I'm hiding where, you know, uh, why, where I'm at, you know, many different programs are layered over me protecting where I, and if the opposing hacker, and so it's his own little side combat, which in interface two right. zero, I'm going to say is does very, very well. Then I could very realistically say that this side little combat happens. He gets initiative order and the whole thing. And if he gets discovered, then there will be a consequence to that action. But if not, great, he stays hidden. Well, I think at the core of this really is, you know, we're talking about with these character types. The core of it is that they have a special set of rules that slow down or just can derail the game. I remember back in second edition Shadowrun, uh, back when before the, uh, Virtual Realities 2.0 came out and they had the new streamlined security chief rule. So, yeah, what we're talking about is ideas that special rules that can slow down or derail the game. And hackers and netrunners are, are a really good example of that. But I think you can even extrapolate that a little bit to other types of characters. And this is actually where Jedi come into play for me sometimes is that you can – it can become an argument argument session with the GM over whether the Force can do that or not, right? Yeah. Uh and another good example, especially um, in the D20 era, was uh, characters that uh, engage in a lot of uh, shape-shifting and characters that engage in a lot of grappling. Yep. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> I definitely do. There's an awful lot of page turning when it comes to either of those sections. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of head hanging for GMs when you go, I'd like to grapple. It's like, ah, oh, really? Well, <laughs> well, no, it, gets, it's, it's, it can be that, but it can also be, I want to transform into a dire bear. Flip, 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 which has the, which has these effects on me. Flip, 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 flip. Then I hit him and then grapple for free. Flip, 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 flip. And then the GM's just like, Oh boy, I just lost 20 minutes of my life. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the whole table's lost 20 minutes of their life. 20 minutes of the game, really. Yeah. So, so that, you know, it's not just the, uh, the special snowflakes. It can be pretty much anything that focuses on a, 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 a specialist of a specialism in uh, slowing the game down or derailing it. But is mechanics. that is that also a fault of? It's not. Yeah, you're you're right. It's not the character's fault. It's it's really the mechanics of the game are at fault. Well, the mechanics and and you know, is it something where it's like you get stuck too much into what a the cookie cutter approach of what a D and D game should look like, what a cyberpunk game should look like, where you know maybe. You know, and this is a stretch. I'm kind of a hippie when it comes to game stories at the game table. But I mean, you know, it should be everyone at the tables bringing something to the story. I like that approach. Maybe one person, you know, for one game. Yeah, it is. It is going to be the bard. The bard's going to be a ma massive player. Much like if you read Order of the Stick, you know, he, uh, Elon, right? Is that his name? Yes. Sure. sure. It's, I, is that the right name? I can't remember. Anyways, he, he gets a ton of. Yes, it is. He gets a ton of um, strip time. That sounds wrong, but you can't say screen time. <laughs> well, actually, for Aelin, that's completely right. Aelin, yes. I'm it. invisible. I'm invisible, yes. And he, <laughs> he takes off all his clothes. But he gets he gets those moments in the sun. And then the next time, it's like, okay, well, this is more combat-oriented. I'm, I'm willing to say, I, I as a GM, I take a lot of the blame for if a player cannot find what, you know, or use his skills in, in an effective way in my game. Because then maybe that's a little bit my failing. Now, Minus the kind of the guy who's just being a jerk, just trying to disrupt the game, just to disrupt the game. But, you know, okay. someone, if someone says, I want to try to steal the sword from the bad guy, it's like, well, OK, let's see if this can happen. I'm, I'm going to hold you accountable for anything that goes wrong in your game, Justin. It's all your fault. I, I absolutely <laughs> am accountable up to, I'll say, 80 <laughs> <laughs> percent. You know, a couple of things we haven't mentioned so far is uh, it kind of you know, they came out at the same time as Kender, although for some reason I haven't seen nearly as many of them, um, but they are a thing that exist. Uh, Tinker Gnomes, you know what I'm talking about there? Yep. They're rarer than Kender, but they do exist, and they are also disruptive. It is all the annoyance of a gnome that likes to make traps with all the annoyance of a Kender. 
At least that's the interpretation I get from every single person I see. I've never actually seen one played either. I've never seen one played either. Maybe this is an urban legend. <laughs> <laughs> they exist. I know they do. There's stats and books and stuff. Yeah, but if they've never been played, hmm, just saying. Tree falls in the forest. <laughs> Does anyone I, care? <laughs> I, I have been known to play a gnome. Uh, I don't think there's really anything wrong with playing gnomes. If you're playing a gnome, you are pretty much pigeonholed in a non-combat or at least non-frontline role, I would say, most of the time. And I think one of the reasons why gnomes get maligned so much is you have elves who are the arcane magicians who are in touch with nature and druids and wizards and fancy sword fighters. You have the dwarves who are nice, stout, hardy fighters with axe and shields, and they mine and no stone cutting. And then you have the halflings who are, well, we've all seen The Hobbit and we want to play Frodo and Bilbo. And then you have the gnomes who don't have a thing. <laughs> they really kind of don't have a thing unless it's Tinker Gnomes, which no one plays in the, in the first damn place. Well, gnomes gnomes have tall pointy hats and, and Travelocity. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the other thing is the two builds that gnomes seem to be made for, at least in 3.5 and Pathfinder, that's my most experience with gnomes, are Bards and illusionists. So maybe it's guilt by association there. Possibly. Uh, guilt from association and uh, obscurity. They they don't have a real identity like the other races do. You know, something I think is great is actually we've talked about all these different types of characters. And we've all kind of agreed that their only problems, you know, in certain ways are only problems, you know, some of the time. Uh before we move on, though, I want to ask uh, Brandon and Justin, is there any of these character types that we maybe haven't touched on yet? Uh, glitter Boys and Riffs. Oh, that's a good one. Rockers and Shadowrun. <laughs> well, yeah. Actually, Rockers can oh. be kind of awesome. I mean, it depends. But although I would even go, I would go a little bit more uh, rare on that one, a little, little further out in left field and say Rockers in Robotech. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. I went there. Yeah. <laughs> There, there, there's an awesome storyline. Every Robotoxin right has to childhood. have a scene. <laughs> right in the childhood. Uh, yeah, they actually came out with a source book for, uh, it's called Lancer's Rockers. Hmm. It had, it had transforming instrumecha. What? This, I know. This isn't real, right? You're just making this <laughs> no, up to make you feel No, sick. it's real. I'm sorry to say. All right, but let's talk about the glitter boy. <laughs> let's just, let's just, let's just leave that in the dust where it belongs. <laughs> talk about the glitter boy. Yeah, I mean, uh, Glitter Boys and Riffs. I mean, I, again, it's, I think it's kind of a cool concept. And if you were playing, I, I mean, in the way, I think they're kind of the Jedi or the uh, of of Riffs. It's I, it sort of makes sense that there would be a bunch of these guys roaming around. But anything where it's like, hey, in combat, you have to hold still, and pylons are going to shoot down into the ground, so you can fire your rail gun. You know, it, it's like, yeah. You know, where do you fit in with this, you know, with the dragon and the juicer and all these other guys? Where where do you, where does this guy come from? And why is he here? You know, to me, it's more of a story breaking element than even an overpowered kind of silly element. Well, it gets more interesting uh, later on. Of course, there's a a book, Triax 2, that came out not so long ago that introduced the flying glitter boy that can actually shoot his gun while flying. Of course, because that's the one thing Glitter Boys need is more mobility. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's called the Hell Angel. Wow. Um, now I just yeah. got to get that book just to see that. <laughs> <laughs> just to read about it and uh, be upset. <laughs> so Glitter Boys, I, you know, they're kind of – well, I, I didn't see them so much as Jedi except as, as a – as a way to make cyborgs and other robot pilots feel sorry about themselves. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I'm playing a full conversion cyborg. Cool. I'm playing the glitter boy. So that means I'm tougher than you, do more <laughs> damage than you. Uh, you know, same shtick, but better, you know? Uh, and yeah. you're, you're like, I, I drive a, a giant robot. Well, that's great. I am a glitter boy pilot. I probably do more damage than you and. <laughs> I will, et cetera, et cetera. And I will be back here just raining fire and hell upon our enemies while you're getting your your nuts kicked in. I mean, he, he is the <laughs> he is the oversized Chevy truck of role playing games. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, I think Rifts is a really, really cool setting, and I do really like Glitter Boys. I think they're great. I think they're actually kind of iconic uh, at this point. Uh, well, don't get me wrong. I, think I, it's, I love Rifts. It's, 
it's fair to say there could be a better Im- implementation of them in, as far as what you just said, how they fit in a party. Well, and I, I think they kind of suffer from uh, Robotox Southern Cross um, kind of where you, everyone needs to run kind of the same mech. You know what I mean? In Southern Cross, everyone has to run. I forget what they call the tanks and those. But it doesn't Ajax. Work, yeah, the Ajax. There you go. It doesn't make sense to have just one or two kind of separated. Oh out. no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Sorry. Ajax are the helicopters. They're the ATACs, right? The the Spartans. Now you're messing me up. Or Spar- Spartus. God. Now I got to look it up on Google. Anyways, but we I, need, I, we I, need a Jason Marker on the show. He he'll tell us all. About <laughs> yeah, he'll he'll shame <laughs> us. Um, but I think it makes sense that if you said, "Oh, we're gonna have a campaign, and you guys are playing." Uh, you know, uh, a squad of glitter boys. It's like, oh, okay, interesting. That I could see, but that's me. Yeah. That's kind of the all Jedi, no Jedi thing where it's, and I think the problem with Jedi is a combination of what you're talking about and what I was talking about and uh, everyone else as well with uh, Deckers, where it's on one hand, you have, they're pretty much because they have the force and no one else does, they end up kind of better than everyone else. And on the other hand, Anytime there's a combat, it's like, here's your squad of stormtroopers. That's for you guys to fight. And then here's your Sith in the dark robes. That's for you to have your lightsaber duel over here. Although I will point out there's a really excellent episode by Spoonie, uh, yes. um, Counter Monkey, where he debunks that myth. And it's actually a the really, Jedi Hunter episode. It's, it's actually really, really entertaining. And I, I highly recommend it. We should uh, have a link for that in the show notes. Um, okay. So, uh, Brandon, before we move on, anything else you wanted to say about character types? Um, <clears throat> no, per- everyone has pretty much, uh, stolen the words out of my mouth for the most part. <laughs> um, How dare you, sir? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, no, that's, uh, I... No, it, 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 I'm a kinder, it just fell into my pocket. Yeah, it, that, exactly. <laughs> I was just holding it for you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will take that back now. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I would say is just, for the sake of balance... Everything that we've said here is easily debunked on a individual level just through good play, which is the thing that really gets me about this sort of uh, theory that certain character types are uh, more disruptive than others. It's just it falls upon the the responsibility responsibility falls more upon the individual than the rest of the game is what causes a lot of the problems. Yeah, it's you're basically quoting Whedon's law here. Yes. So that's the next point I was actually going to move on to. But before we do that, let's take a break, and then we'll be right back. Drive Through RPG is the place to go to purchase digital copies of your favorite games: Dungeons and Dragons, Shadowrun, World of Darkness, Savage Worlds, Numenera, Fate, and so many more. Do you long for the feel of actual paper in your hands? Well, they sell physical products too. Just go to GamersTavern.org and click on the link in the show notes to find your favorite games and support the podcast with every purchase. So we were talking about um, these problem character types that cause a lot of uh, you know negative feedback or negative feelings, and we were Brandon was just reminding us that. Uh, you know, these oftentimes are really just player problems and not so much character specific problems, which is a really good point. And that's where I want to bring us in is, is have the, this be the new question to, to discuss. How can you fix the perception of these character types in your group? By playing them well. I, I think a, what a lot of the problem is, a lot of the misperception comes from the fact that most people are exposed to all these different classes and races when they're first starting playing role playing games. And that's usually when you're in your early teens in high school or in middle school and not ex- all of these classes in order to or races or clans or whatever have to have s- maturity and nuance to them to make them work in a party environment. And if there's anything I did not have when I was 13 years old, it was nuance or maturity. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and some may argue I still don't. I, I didn't even know when he was 13, so, but yeah. Uh, you know, nuance and maturity, that's actually a really good way to describe what you need in order to make these work. Uh, what do you think, Justin? I, I think you have to be, I think you have to sort of break free of of the stereotype. Yeah, thinking outside the box, doing something different. I, I think you have to be willing to... <sighs> To at least not be perceived as, oh, you're just going to be another one of uh, these character types X. You have to sort of say, I am going to take a brand new angle on this. Not not break free of what's cool about the, the class or the race, but just sort of say, well, 
if I'm a Jedi, how can I make this character more interesting? I mean, on an example, my head would be that you're a Jedi who doesn't want people to know you're a Jedi. You keep it to yourself a lot. And, you know, you just sort of try to go through life. So, so you play old Ben. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, but either way, you you do something where it's like when the story calls for it or when it's needed, then it's like those skills that you have come out. But, but And so that way it makes you not – it makes you mysterious without being the silly, angry loner type, but it also doesn't make your class overpowering. But I think that takes a level of maturity and and sort of character development that maybe not a lot of players want to deal with, especially if you're running something like a Jedi. Yeah. Well, you've, you've hit on a really good point there too. One thing I like to do, if I have a character who is really good at something like a specific area that they just are really, really good at, I tend to not want to bust that out right away. I tend to want to be the, you know, the guy that sort of sits in the back for a while, and then when it's appropriate, go booyah! Yeah, <laughs> check me out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just for a different opinion slash view on it, is that with a lot of these character types, uh, like I was saying, like I had said earlier in the cast, a lot of them are just mechanically incentivized to play in a way that is disruptive. If it's Jedi, it's just being freaking Jedi. If it's, you know, being a kinder, your mechan- or a paladin rather, uh, you're mechanically incentivized to, uh, do such, you know, said things. A different way to approach it, and this might just be my video game background coming out, is, uh, change the mechanics upon which the disruptive play is based. <clears throat> for example, for hackers and deckers in Shadowrun, change the way the mechanics work so that you're not sending everyone out for pizza when the decker decides to do his thing. Change the mechanics to cause the gameplay to not lose its focus or lose its flow, and that can actually solve quite a bit of the problems that you see. And like Ross had said, I had actually modified the mechanics for those two or three deckers that actually made the game a richer environment instead of just, oh, the decker's doing his thing, we're going to go over here. Uh, The same thing can be true of bards, uh, since a lot of people say they're underpowered. Simply change the mechanics, beef them up a bit. Make them a viable player class that you would actually want to play instead of just pointing and mocking. I would also say uh, you need to be communicative. You need to talk to your group a little bit. You need to say, hey, guys, I want to play a bard because, you know, and and just kind of get everybody on on board with what your expectations are. And maybe that'll help, you know, reduce some of the the potential issues uh, that come up with that. You know, talk about what playing a kinder means to you, right? Yeah. And say, maybe even open up the question, like, how, you know, what are some ways I can do that you guys would think would be cool? You know, I, cause, cause what you don't want to do is you don't want to interpret it in such a way where it becomes uh, a behavior that is disruptive. I just know my first experience with kinder colored every single experience thereafter because a deck of many things was involved. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Well, that's a thing on its own. I mean, it doesn't even need a kinder to be. That needs its own episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Imagine a kinder with a deck of many things hanging around. Wow. Talk about causing problems. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say let's, you know, let's talk it out a little bit. Uh, just because I, I tend to be the guy I don't want to just shut you down and say you can't play a kinder or you can't play a Malkavian, you know, I, I, but you know, I would want to be the guy who asks the question of what is it about playing Mal- Malkavian that's, that's interesting to you? Let's find a way to make that work in the group. Yeah. Cause I, to me, like it, it, that's the application of Whedon's law here is everyone's here to have a good time. Let's find ways to make the character interesting and unique that doesn't end up making other people not have fun. I think that right. it's uh, it's interesting though that uh you know changing the mechanic but also I think you have to change your story a little bit. And I, I'm going to say something that might sound a little strange but if I'm playing something a character that is not very good at combat, is not a combat class and you you're running a game that's going to have a see a lot of combat, then make that PC the bard or whomever important to the party to the point that maybe someone else, and this might, this takes communication where someone else in the party is like, I'm going to protect that guy. It is my goal to make sure he's okay. And that way it sort of involves him and the rest of the party into the story where they're trying to make sure this guy makes it to the end. Right. You know, and he has something special. He is, he is Bilbo because he is the burglar. He has one job 
and one job only. <laughs> and he, he has to live until he gets to those, those mines to defeat the dragon, to find, you know, what he's looking for. So that whole party's thing is we got to protect this one guy because he, he can't fight. He can't do anything else. We got to make sure he lives. That's not a bad way to go. Yeah. Um, I would even say maybe it's, it's incumbent on you as a player though, to also consider the group dynamic before even making a character and consider what, and this obviously comes down to a discussion between you and the GM, right? But you know, if, if your game is going to be about return to the tomb of horrors, playing a Kender is really not a good idea, right? Cause that's, <laughs> you know, that the tomb of horrors is full of, you know, Bad. crazy nail biting fights, right? Yeah. Um, but if we're playing in Waterdeep and it's a very social game, you know, maybe you can be like, hey, I'm going to play a bard. I'm going to play an illusionist because in Waterdeep, an illusionist would be awesome for all these different reasons, right? So, yeah, it's it's, it's going to come down to that. It's going to come down to whether it fits the tone of the group, of the tone of the uh, the setting, tone of the game. If I'm doing a game in Ravenloft, if I'm trying to run horror, don't bring me a Kender because they're not scared of anything, right? Yeah. That breaks the tone. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's responsibility on the player. Uh, there's communication, there's fixing mechanics, you know, there are ways to, to change these perceptions. And I think that's important. And one thing that I've started to really get into as I've gotten older is I kind of like playing these type of quote unquote unplayable characters and try to find ways to play them that aren't disruptive or bad or anything like that. Uh, I love playing paladins. Now I hated it when I was a kid because you have to be lawful goody two shoes. And, uh, we brought this up on the alignment episode. Uh, Captain America is a good example of lawful good. That's not boring. Yeah. As a character. Well, that's, you know, that's a really interesting question. Do you guys have anything more you'd want to say about perception, about fixing perception before we move on? No, but everyone's equal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Except for bards. May the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> yeah, the the best way to fix perception is to be the example that you want everyone to see. Okay, so let's, you know, Daryl just brought up a really great point, and I want to address that. Have you guys in your history as gamers, have you played characters that you would have considered that looking back, you know, were a problem because of that character, because of the race or because of the class or because of the way you played him? Oh yeah. I, I, I played a, um, I think it was a barbarian in a third edition or no second edition game. And I played him stupid to a fault and to the point where it just, it, it became like two games in the other players look at me like, are you kidding me? Like I, I played him with this kind of concept that he hated knowledge because he felt like it was making him feel stupid. And maybe this was, you know, something in my person, <laughs> something in my personality coming out, but uh, you know, it's like, Oh, we found this map. That's very important. And I'm like, Ooh, let me see map. And I take a map and I go, oh, let me rip up Matt. I don't like knowledge. I do not understand. And it's like, okay, I'm just being a jerk. And I, I like two games in, I sort of said, okay, pull back on that a little bit and just be the tough guy who doesn't quite understand. And it won't be involved in the social aspect of the games, but he will be, you know, if it's important to the party, then it's important to him. You know, you were animal from the Muppet show. I was much worse than animal in the Muppet <laughs> animal in the Muppet show would have been a, a pleasure to have in the party compared to my guy in the first two games. Crazy Harry then. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That's always been one of my most favorite, interesting bits of trivia about the Dresden files was, uh, have you guys read Dresden files books at all? A bit. Well, in one book they talk about, uh, we're, we can't storm this place like we're the Bolshevik Muppet from the Muppet Show. And later on, they end up having to blow the place. And so, and so in order to warn everyone, he shouts, Bolshevik Muppet Plan. And the main character's name and his modus operandi is usually... One of the books started off, and it was something he actually needed to say to clarify. The first line is, the building was on fire, and it wasn't my fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just found one of the best jokes is, in that book is... They never name what the name of that Muppet is, and the Muppet's name is Crazy it's Harry. Crazy Harry, yeah. Brand, what about you, Brandon? Have you ever played a character that uh, you felt was a, a problem or uh, ended up being hated? A, a problem, yes. I was able to stop it from being a problem before it got hated, but I I was playing a hacker <laughs> in uh, a Shadowrun game. And because I am the kind of person that just geeks out on mechanics, this hacker was also a combat savant and also able to social day. So I was essentially, <laughs> I was essentially the person that could do everything in the game better than anyone else in the party. And the first game or two, 
I was hard on on doing that. I solved three sh- three runs in the course of a single session because of the way I was playing the character. And I the second time or the second session, I actually noticed that hey, this is just kind of me soloing the game, and that's not fun for the other four people that are here. And basically, the way I solved it was instead of utilizing my character to their absolute best potential. I shifted my play to basically segue into other players' strengths. Like, say we're going into a social situation. My character would, because everybody apparently pointed to me first, I would do something and then segue over to the face. Or combat started, I would do something to allow the uh, street sams to do their thing that much better. I switched from the primary everything role to the support pretty much everything role. And that actually solved a lot of the problems that were going to be problems uh, before it actually happened, which I'm glad it did because that turned out to be a great game because the other players then were able to get invested into the uh, story. That does sound like a good way to handle it. Yeah. A a good player always helps other players have um, opportunities of awesome as well. Yes. (laughs) Daryl, what about you? Well, aside from my current love of paladins, one thing I, it wasn't my character, but someone in my group, and this is when it was almost a slap in the face to me because I'd always known Malkavians as fish milks. And then someone came to the table with their, uh, every single Malkavian has to have some sort of mental illness. This one was OCD. So it was extreme obsessive compulsive disorder. Very, very quiet, very subdued person who just went behind everyone cleaning up everything. And when they said something very soft spoken and just being a little bit pedantic and correcting them and made a really, really, really good use of the Auspex power to be basically the person who got the information that no one else could get by, you know, reading auras and all that kind of stuff. And it was just a complete shock to me because I'd never seen a a Malkavian played straight before. So huh. that's one that's one way to approach it is he was basically a monk. Pretty yeah. much, yes. <laughs> and it worked out really well with the party because it wasn't sure the O C D thing came up and it was a little bit disruptive, but it wasn't overpower it, it was like early season monk, not late. Let's just what can we throw the O C D guy into to make fun of him, monk? But <laughs> Hey, I watched all seven seasons, thank you. So so did I, and uh, it, it just anyway. Uh but that was a really big thing to me because it was played the character exactly like it's written in the book. And it was kind of, like I said, it was a shock to the system. It was like nowhere in the book does it say that Malkavians have to be played like Looney Tunes. Yeah. I think they actually benefit when they're not played that way. Yeah. And it became a really interesting, really developed character and it helped out the party, the, the group. And it was really, really good. Um, I have played, um, a lot of these characters. I have played bards. I have played gnomes. I have played hackers and kenders and Malkavians. I probably played like one of everything on the list. Kenders are the ones that stuck out in my head the most because I, when I was a kid, I read those Dragonlance novels and I just adored them. Um, and of course, my favorite character at that time, uh, was Tasselhoff. So. I wanted to play a Kender. And yeah, I found out very, very quickly just how disruptive that is because it changes encounters with skeletons, you know, which should be kind of scary in a typical, you know, fantasy environment. Oh no, the dead walk. You know, even, even in the Harryhausen, you know, sort of they're, they're coming after me, uh, you know, in waves like Jason and the Argonauts. It should be at the very least exciting. And because Kenders just don't feel fear. And the like the steel stuff, yeah, it turned into it turned into a farce. Um I solved that problem by just not playing Kender anymore, honestly. <laughs> um Well, I'm thinking one way that you could do that, uh the Kender with the skeleton example specifically and probably extract I was like I said, kind of try to play it a little bit more straight. What's going to add more fear to the rest of the party than the probably the physically weakest person walking straight up to the skeletons without any fear and basically challenging them toe to toe. They're going to be fearing for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still think that's disruptive, I think. Uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's, there are ways to do it where it fits into the group dynamic. Absolutely. But I think that pretty much wraps up what we were talking about with the, the, the character types that we love to hate. So let's gather up our, uh, our final thoughts on this subject. Brandon, what's your final thoughts on character types that we love to hate? Uh, my final thought is that 
character types that we love to hate for whatever reason, the old saying goes true, the stereotype exists for a reason. And if you feel compelled to make a change, be prepared to be the example that you want the new stereotype to be, as opposed to just falling into the same traps that caused that stereotype to be a thing in the first place. Uh, ultimately, even though there are ways to mechanically fix this or rejiggering you can do behind the scenes, it ultimately falls upon the player to do it correctly. And that's, I think, the end state that the discussion has come to. Justin? Uh, I think that uh, I agree with what was just said, uh, but also I would add communication is key. I think every solution comes from communication with the group you're playing with, your GM, your fellow players, uh, and make sure you're running something that makes sense. You know, yeah, everyone has that character class or type they really want to play and they really want to to work on it. Just because an opportunity presents itself doesn't mean that's the time you should. Um, so again, communication, communication, communication. And if you're going to play the angry loner, don't do it. Just stop and don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, what are your final thoughts? My final thoughts, different than the other two, but I completely agree with everything they said. But I think the third pillar of that would be put a lot of thought into if you're wanting to play one of these character types think about what that character type means in the world and look at it in a re sort of a realistic way and examine what it is that ha that gives this build the bad perception it has and how you can either use the tropes to your advantage or circumvent them invert them subvert them come up with something that is going to let you play the character you want to play without ruining the game for everyone else or without basically grinding the game to a halt or being dead weight. I, I agree with pretty much everything we said. Um, I really like a lot of things we've talked about tonight. The only thing I would probably want to say as a final thought is uh, just remember that these character types are not irredeemable. That you, you, There's no reason for you not to go out and play a Malkavian or not to try a Gnome or not to try a Bard. You can. You certainly can. You should. Um, you know, and, and sometimes that's just part of life and part of role playing as well is just sort of playing things and figuring out what you like and what, what works and what doesn't work for you and what works and what doesn't work for your group. But at the end of the day, I think we, we had a lot of good things to say about this topic. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad we actually, uh, we got to explore it. It's not something I've heard actually discussed very often in, in this sort of, uh, analytical way. So I'm glad we got to that. And on behalf of uh, Daryl and myself, I want to extend our uh, deep gratitude to Brandon Gensimer and Justin Suzuki for joining us on the show tonight. Thank you so much for coming on, guys. Thanks for having me. And just saying to Justin, if you ever want us to, you know, come on your show. <laughs> you, guys, you guys, any of you are always welcome on either of my shows and even shows I haven't even started yet. Well, I was on the I was on the inaugural uh, episode of Roleplay DNA, so I try not to. Roleplay DNA you. That's right. Yep. Roleplay DNA U. I was on the inaugural episode, so I was trying not to like overplay myself, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> and, and you've been on Smiling Jacks. I have. But if, if there ever comes a time, I'm just saying where it would be appropriate, well, we, I think we'd, we'd really enjoy going over there. So before we, uh, close up the bar, the Imperial Guards are, uh, doing their sweep. Last calls being heard and, uh, Mac, the bartender, is giving us the eye. Let's, uh, just quickly give our guests an opportunity to, uh, Make sure the fans know where they can find them on the web and what their latest thing is. Brandon, what's your latest thing and where can we find you on the interwebs? Um, my latest thing is just simply the uh, Twitch channel and Gaber's Tavern. You can find me at gametable.gaberstavern.org. That's where you can find me uh, GMing the Shadowrun Actual Play podcast. And you can also find me at uh, www.twitch.tv slash ympulse101. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. All right. And Justin, what's your latest thing and where can we find you on the interwebs? Uh, my latest thing right now is I'm actually preparing um, to do, I mentioned a charity game day here in Broomfield, Colorado. We're doing a charity game day to benefit the Homefront Cares, which is a veterans assistance charity. Oh, nice. So on May 10th, uh, Broomfield, Colorado, Total Escape Games, we're doing an all day game uh, day, <laughs> role playing games, board <laughs> games. Yeah, I didn't know how to say that. Um, <laughs> And we're doing all day game day. All day game day. Uh, 100% of the proceeds go to charity, uh, which again is the home front cares. Uh, you can find information about that at gamersgiving.org. That's my terrible organization. Uh, and then, uh, of course, roleplaydna.com and smilingjacksbarngrill.com. Those are the two podcasts I'm on. And uh, I have some other podcasts I'm sure I could promote, but I'm not going to go into the 
the other podcasts I produce and on. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to say, I think I could imagine easily either one of you guys on the uh, next season of King of the Nerds. Just something to think about. You know, <laughs> I, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Well, Ivan's been on the show twice. Ivan Van Norman. That's so. true. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I was going to ask uh, Justin about conventions because I know you do a lot of conventions. Um, what's next for you on convention season? Convention season for me, the next one where actually my podcast will be represented in, and I might be doing some gaming is uh, Denver Comic Con, uh, which is June, oh, I want to say 13th, 14th, or 15th. I could be wrong on that. Uh, we're actually trying to get you, Mr. Ross Watson, out. Woo! I would love to go. <laughs> I would love to say that I would love to be able to announce that. Yes, as your agent, I've secured you. <laughs> uh, but I'm still in negotiations with the management at Denver Comic Con. Um, but if Ross well, is going to have my own trailer, uh, look, if you could just give up on the trailer <laughs> and maybe bring your fee down to ten thousand, even for the weekend, I think wow. we can get you in. No, so uh, Ross demands a trailer, and he's not leaving his trailer until he gets a bigger trailer. <laughs> yeah, he actually wanted a trailer parked into a larger trailer on top of a boat, and we're a landlocked state. I don't know what he wants from us. Um, but no, we're trying to Listen, get Ross. How out. hard is it to get Optimus Prime? Uh, you know, not that hard. But ho- so hopefully, hopefully Ross will be at Denver Comic Con. But if any of the uh, fans are going to be at Denver Comic Con, I'll be there representing my network at our on Podcast Alley or Podcast Peak. I forget what they call it there. Uh, so you can find I believe it's podcast peak. It is podcast peak. You can find P five productions. Uh, we'll, we'll be represented there. I think I have four or five shows being represented there. So we'll be there recording and just handing out whatever. And if Ross is there, we're going to let him hang out at our table. Awesome. Do you have some swag and stuff to give away? I'm going to hopefully have just like business cards to give away. We we're, we're, we're an up and coming network. What can I say? I don't okay. have an operating budget. <laughs> I, you I, know what? Get, get in while you're on the ground floor and you could turn this into a big thing. That's all I'm saying. Anybody who goes to DCC, definitely check out uh podcast peak, especially uh role play DNA. Cause uh, it's a great show. Yep. Thank you. And uh that brings us to convention season for Daryl and I, we are going to be at comic Palooza. Which, uh, by the time this mm-hmm. podcast airs, will be right around the corner. Um, it's May 20th. 23rd through the 26th. Right. Directly after my birthday, I might add. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Houston, Texas. Um, it's basically the Texas Comic Con, if you want to look at it that. It's, it's one of the Texas Comic Cons. It is friggin' huge. I was there last year covering it for Anical News, and dear God, it's three floors of the downtown convention center. Yeah, it's. Uh, so, I'm looking forward to it. And after there were that, like five game rooms or something like that for tabletop alone. We're also going to be in Galveston doing animation celebration, which is in July. And uh, thing go, if things go right, we'll actually be recording in a panel room during the convention and recording a live episode. Woohoo! And then, of course, uh, the big show Gen Con in August. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will be there, and of course, I will be uh, running some accursed, and we will have some really cool things to say about Accursed, hopefully in the future as well. So with all of that, I think that brings us to an end for this episode. Thanks again to Justin and Brandon. Thank you. And may all your hits be crits. It's 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 be crits.